really fulfill the royal law of the Lord. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you have been sick and not convicted or convinced by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of the law. For he who said that I commit adultery also said that I murdered. For if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, but say the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. But mercy triumphs over judgment. Probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible. For some reason, uh, American Christians on a regular basis tend to forget that mercy triumphs over judgment. And a lot of times we love the idea of judgment and retribution over mercy. And yet his mercy endures forever. And there's this whole long songs that, that God had people say stuff that he doesn't want them to repeat back. His mercy endures forever. 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 Not only really does it endure forever, but if you even try to turn back and go the other way, mercy and goodness bump into you. And then he pushes you forward, or his, his goodness and mercy follow you in the days of your life. Yet, that for some reason, we think that he is, uh, but his mercy endures forever. And if you can see behind that one point, that leads to the good. Praise the Lord. So let, let me start by saying this. Um, one of the things that happens when, uh, when you begin to preach the, the gospel, Gospel of Jesus, the way it was always supposed to be preached, which is, first of all, good news. Uh, you know, a good portion of my life growing up was, you know, people with the good news. So good, I got to be real honest with you. I'm going to push it off the limit. It was good news about once every six months, and that's when they say Jesus loves you, and you're saying, uh, but then about, you know, the rest of the six months is if and but why, when, and how. If you do this, if you do that, if you think, you know, that he loves you, he loves you, but, you know, and if you look funny at somebody, it's, you know, he doesn't love you no more. And, and of course, run to the altar. And, and, you know, the more the church always was full, the more the preaching got about themselves. I, 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 I tell my church at home on a regular basis, you know, I mean, it's a nice If you realize that the less the altars are full of believers constantly needing stuff, the more people are preaching the gospel according to Why? Because the more you comprehend his love and who you are in him, you start to understand that you're a son. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with praying and agreeing. We still be praying for the sick and encouraging and the whole thing. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that. But, but if, if, if every service, you know, we, we've got to constantly get people down here and they're all oh, good and they're going through it. And then, I mean, it's, I mean, there's some people that come into altars for 20 years for the same stuff. Because rather than informing them and giving them confidence to be overcomers, we continue to remind them what they were not, so they constantly struggle for 20 or 30 years. And rather than being good news, a lot of times they left the building feeling worse than when they got there. And there's a lot of times, I mean, you know, I've shown up feeling not that bad, but I'm not preaching out there. We're trying to get out of the building, and you think, oh man, I'm a worm, I'm a worm, I'm useless, I'm just a rotten sinner. And I mean, by the time they got done, I was like, well, I did bad news, that wasn't even good news anymore. Well, I know it's Sunday morning, and this is my life. But what happens to us is when, when you begin to preach radical love and radical grace and the goodness of God, the way it was meant to be preached in Christ, is people then will, will, will accuse you of lawlessness. Uh, because we, we tell people that we're no longer under the law of Moses. And as James said, you know what? I mean, if you want to stay under the law of Moses, I just tell people, I'm not going to argue with you anymore. Make back yourself up. But if you think you can keep all, all the 613, and that's not an area code, I mean, if you, if you think you can keep all the 613, we can go for it. I mean, you're having a hard time just keeping the big head, you know, let, let alone the rest of the 603. But I mean, if you want to do it, we can go for it. I'm not going to argue with you, I'm not going to fight with you. But just know that Jesus nailed it to the cross, okay? It's, he, he abolished it in his body. You know, I, I, I people on Facebook want to argue with people about other things. Like, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. I'm like, yeah, in his, in his, in his birth and his life, he came to fulfill the law. But in his death, burial, and resurrection, he abolished it. All right, 
According to Ephesians 2, that baby is a bollocks. Okay? He nailed it to the cross once and for all when he studied Romans 7, dealing with the, the law compared to the goodness of God and grace and the hope that he can be married. And he uses a word about putting away. It's literally the same word, a bollocks. So just know that the, the law is not what you and I come to. Romans 10, verse 4, Christ is the end of the law to him who believes. However, we're still under law. But we're not under the law of Moses or the law of sin and death. We are under what Paul calls the law of love. The law of love, what James called the royal law. I like that better than you. I'm under the royal law. Yeah. I'm under the law of liberty. So we're still covered this. This thing when all of a sudden you're going to spend the love of God and grace of God just to be, hey, 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 party time. You know, I mean, I just do whatever I want, whatever I want. We're still comforted. We're, we're, we're not antinomians. We're not, we're not lawless. It's just the law is changed. It's a different administration. I'm not governed by love. And, and according to Galatians 5, and I love it especially the Message Bible, because Galatians 5 is all about, you know, Paul talking about 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 Paul He's talking about the circumcision. He's talking about the Jews. And he said, I wish those boys would just go all the way and castrate themselves or something. You know, there's some pretty intense language in there, just a little bit. <laughs> but then Paul makes this little statement and he says this. He said, Don't let your freedom destroy your liberty. You know, in Christ, all things are permissible. They're just not beneficial. So, I can have this incredible freedom now in Christ, but my freedom can also destroy my freedom because he goes on to say real freedom is loving one another. He's like, if you want to know what real freedom looks like, it is, it is the, the, this amazing exchange of life and love that you encourage, uh, that you encourage one another with because, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have the freedom, I have the freedom as a new covenant. Destroyed your freedom because guess what? You're going to jail. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff we have freedom in. It's not an issue of necessarily sin or right or wrong, but, but we can we can use our freedom for our And that's the real freedom is loving one another. So it's interesting. Ever since we got into 2016,
there's that one example where the apostles told us to love God. In fact, they told us that we're loved by God. But we're not told necessarily to love God outside of a context of loving humanity. So Jesus one day, Jesus is questioned by the Pharisees, and the Pharisees said this to him. They said, what, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, now get this, they're asking for one commandment. And Jesus says this. He said, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. You know, and I don't know about you, but if I would have been asking the question, this is just my personality, I'd have been like this too. I didn't ask you for the two greatest commandments. I asked you for the single greatest commandment. I can I can almost see Peter sitting there going, you know, Jesus, you just mess up with everybody's constantly subversive. He asked you one question, dude. One question. What is the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. You're like, wait a minute. That's not one commandment. That's two commandments. But it's one of the gospels. It actually goes on to say that Jesus said, for these are the same. In other words, how you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength shows then on how you love humanity. Now, now, now some of you some of you have heard this said before, but some I don't want to assume anything. Jesus did tell us to do that. He said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. But he told Jews under the law what the law looked like in the great commandment of the law. But how many of you know you and I, we're not under law? We are under grace. And Jesus actually, you know, for us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves is not a bad thing. It's just, it, it's, it's very, uh, it can be sketchy. Because it really has everything to do with how we feel about ourselves. Okay, so, I mean, if, if I like myself, if I love myself to the point you run into me, it's going to be good for you. I mean, you know, I mean, you're going to enjoy being around me because I love me today. I like me today. So guess what? It's going to be easy for me to love you and like you. But if you run into me on one of those days, I, I know y'all are more spiritual than you never have those days before. But you know, you know, you run into me on one of those days where I don't even, I don't, I don't like anything today. I don't even like me. I don't feel good. You know, I'm tired. It's like I've been traveling all day. I mean, but that's why, that's why, I mean, when Wendy went out, we bought like 10 or 12 things. She's always like, picking me up at the airport. And she's picking me up at the airport at those times. She's just, just, you know, I mean, she, she said, you know, if she, she wants to talk to me, I'm like, I'm like, I'm telling you everything that's gone on the last 10 days. And all I did for 10 days was talk. You know, I mean, I mean, nobody would leave me alone asking me a thousand questions. And I'm just, I don't want to. And I just, you know, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, so, you know, there's any day that you, you can run into us, and if I don't really feel good that day, I don't really like me that day, then it's probably going to speak for you. All right, so that, that has everything to do with what I feel about me. But Jesus, Jesus, to us in the New Covenant, he didn't tell us to just love that way. He said this one day, he said a new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I Love. Now that's a whole nother level. He didn't say love your neighbor just the way you love yourself. He said, I want you to love your neighbor the way I have loved you. And I'm always patient with you. I'm always kind with you. I'm not envious of you. There's no boasting with me. I'm not easily angered. Boy, that's good news all by itself. I keep no record of wrong. That's that's how he loves us. He said, that's how I want you to love. That takes it. Man, it takes it from here and all of a sudden it makes it to a whole new standard. And he said, I don't want you to just love the way you love you. I want you to love the way I loved you. And I laid my life down for you. And the fact that he goes on to even say in John 15 that Jesus in John 13 went on to say this. He said, a new commandment I give to you. And by the way, let me just say this. It's the only commandment. If everybody can just say the same the one time. One time. But he really gave us He's like, hey, if you're going to get something down, I got, I got one rule for you. Yeah. I got one thing for you to get down back. Do you can know how to get to love one another as I have loved you? For in this, the world will know that you're my disciple. And do you know 
that our love for humanity is the only litmus test that we are for the Son. Notice he didn't say, how the world will know you are a disciple. It is by how much Bible you can quote. He didn't say the world will know that you are my disciple by how, how, how good your church attendance is. Or, or how, how faithful of a tither and a giver you are. Or, or, or how many prayer meetings you show up to. All of those things are not bad things. And that a lot of those are good Christian disciplines. It's good to be a part of things. And you, but he didn't say the world will know you online by how specific your prophecies are. And how many people you pray for that falls on the floor. And how many sick people get healed. How much revelation you have that makes people's heads spin. And when, matter of fact, they're not impressed with that. He said there's only one thing that determines if you're a disciple of Him and it's your love for humanity. Watch this, it's not even your love for Him. Love for humanity because how you love humanity is how you show love for Him. Let me, let me just read it. I know we're still going to carry it out of the three scriptures too. that one would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus said, if you want to know what love looks like, you lay down your life for other humans. It's interesting to me. I've had people who want to say that you absolutely want to be with you about who you are and about his friends that you are not. And I've had people say, I don't know, but there's the enemies of God. Not everybody is God's friend. the sins of man, but the sins of all humanity. So, so the, 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 there's no, in God's mind, there's no enemies. Isn't it interesting that God never tells us to love his enemies? Now, just think about that for a minute. He never tells us to love his enemies. He said, love your enemies. Because there's going to be people that are going to get on your nerves. But what gets on your nerves doesn't necessarily get on his nerves. And his mind said, has no enemies. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He looks down at humanity and he sees his family. Jesus came, the scripture tells us, to bring many sons to glory. That word glory there, Old Testament glory, is kabod. It's weightiness. It's heaviness. Because the old covenant glory was heavy. The law was heavy. It was a heavy burden. It weighed you down. The glory weighed you down in the Old Testament. But new covenant glory, doxa, is a Greek word that means he came to bring many sons to honor, to brightness. It also means he came to bring many sons to acceptance to value and worth. Jesus' message was to come to speak to sons. Many of them didn't even know that they were sons. Their sons were acting like orphans because they are alienated from God in their minds. That's why Jesus' message, he showed up preaching, repent, change your mind, change your thinking about me, about religion, about God the Father, everything else, because when your mind just begins to shift it, and you begin to realize that my love for you has always been there. I view humanity as my family. That's why Acts 17, Paul stands up and he says that, that we are all God's offspring. It's translated sons. According to Ephesians 3, he is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the Father of every family named in heaven and earth. There's nobody he ain't daddy to. Sons of the devil, first time said. Like, it makes it like the devil has actual seed. But you believe he's a fallen angel, they're not married or given in marriage, so I'm not where you got some seed from. I mean, you know what? That's, 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 that's not really difficult to really think about. I mean, listen, what we're talking about the, the, the sons of the devil. Which is confusing. That which is, you know, when, when, when Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get thee behind me, he, he wasn't saying, Peter was a literal saint in the image of the He means, like, Listen, what you're saying right now, your thought process, what you're saying is adverse to the kingdom of God, 
God right now. Okay? I mean, the, 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 the first time we talked about that, we talking about those that are still thinking accusation, thinking from a demonic mindset. They have the literal devil's gifts. Come on, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, some of the stuff we believe because we've literalized hyperbole. We, we, we've literalized the book that, is, that has more than 300 figures of speech in it, for heaven's sake. More than 300 figures of speech. And, and, and we try to get to meet some of us that it would have been completely different to someone 2,000 years ago. And they would have absolutely understood what it meant. But God, he looks down on the planet. And this, this is the good news of the gospel. You know what the good news of the gospel is? is that God is like, there's no darkness in him. But according to John chapter 1, that, that he created all of humanity in a sense this, and that he is the light of all men. So guess what? You know what our job in preaching the gospel is? It's not preaching to the darkness in men. It's preaching to the light in men. It's letting them know, you know what? You just don't know there's light in you. But because of what Jesus did, the good news of the cross is 2,000 years ago, when he died, you died with him. When he was raised, you were raised with him. And now, we're calling the sun out of you. That's what Jesus did. He would show up, and he wouldn't preach to the darkness in people. He didn't say, Nathaniel, man, you were making fun of me. Man, you you called me the Antichrist, and I'm not Christ. Instead, he says, behold, Nathaniel, a man in whom there is no dial. He speaks to the sun in him, and it says, immediately becomes a disciple. He meets Peter. The first thing he says to Peter is, you are Simon, but you shall be Peter. I am speaking to the Son in you. I'm speaking to the value and the worth. I'm I'm here to bring sons to acceptance. I'm here to let you know who you really are. You've been thinking like an orphan your whole life because you didn't know. Our our job is to not complain. John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. So we ought to lay down our lives for others. Romans 13.10. Love is the fulfillment of the law. 1 John 4 8, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Love this one. 1 John 3.14. Possessing this love lets us know we have passed from death I mean, how we even know that we pass from death into life is how we, how we love. Let me, let me, let me just let me say this. Man, this has been exploded in the last few months. Jesus really gave us one thing. One thing to get right. And it is the one thing. Generalization. The church in America, rather than being known for the one thing, is known for about everything else. But we're known for arguing and picketing and fighting and judging and shaming and finger pointing. But, but as a whole, the church, if you were to just stop at the mall and interview someone and ask them their opinion of church and Christians, you're going to get anything from bigots. It's a mindset. Rarely. 
only will people say the most loving people we've ever met. I mean, you know, when, when you're the when you're the little girl at Walgreens and you're told by your boss at Christmas time that you know you need to say happy holidays when you're Merry Christmas, and you say happy holidays to one of these Christians and they say, Thanks, Merry Christmas to you. That that'll win her. That does it. Good for you. You're right though, right? I mean, that's the attitude. And then people sense that. I mean, I mean, I sat in a restaurant one time, and I was talking with a pastor and his wife. We're sitting in the booth, and people in the booth over here next to us were cussing up the storm. I mean, you know, f lots or conjunctions, you know. I mean, he was just, you know, I mean, they're just stringing sentences together, and they're GD this and GD that. And I mean, you know, they're, they're saying this stuff, and finally, the next one's in the same party. And they're something to say, excuse me, I'm tired of you taking my Lord's name and their name. All of this busting and everything else. They looked at me, you know, they just went on doing it. And I looked at them and I said, Really? I'm like, That really bothers you? That it bothers you that sinners sin? I mean, well, why does that freak you out? Well, I'm offended with it. I said, Why? Why does that? Why does that offend you? I mean, Jesus was a friend of sinners. I'm telling you, folks were busting like sailors around Jesus, but you know what? They felt perfectly safe in his presence. No one felt like, oh, oh, man, we can't get around him. I mean, he's so holy and he's so righteous that he's going to look down his nose at us. Everybody felt comfortable and safe in his presence. And let's be honest, man, a good portion of my life, people that were not Christians did not feel comfortable in my presence. I used to pride myself. I mean, told the story here, I think, several years ago, but I had a, a few cousins that are older than me that are girls, and they just used to my mind. It's the prophet of God in their presence. So they're, they're under conviction in my holy presence. And so one day the Lord began to speak to me and he said, that I'm feeling conviction, I'm feeling condemnation and sin. That I'm comfortable around you. He said, I want you to go through the Gospels and try to find one time where any unbeliever ever felt uncomfortable in Jesus' presence. I mean, I was almost taught in the Pentecostal church that if a sinner is comfortable around you, there's something wrong with you. There's sin in your life, man. There's sin in your life. Because if sinners feel okay around you, then they're comfortable with your sin, too. And it's like, that's ludicrous. I mean, Jesus, Jesus told me, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to do a couple messages at home uh, called Living a Questionable Life. Jesus lived a very questionable life. He hung out with very unquestionable people. I mean, they would say, you know, listen, man, you, you just let a harlot give you a pedicure and rub you down with essential oil. Right. I mean, sitting at the table, reclining, hey, you know, I mean, and he didn't go, oh, thou is shit is not as touch as me. I am too holy. I mean, she felt comfortable enough to be at his feet. And not only weep over them, but then, I mean, just, just, I mean, what about an interesting scene? I mean, he shows up to parties. And I know for years, preachers have tried to say, well, you know, if you, you know, if you come to the party, you need a grape juice. I mean, you know, listen, it, it doesn't take rocket science. You know, I mean, you had a bunch of folks that have been drinking for a while and they said they got in the wine and it makes us a wine. And, and the government keeps saying, man, this is the best stuff we ever had. How can they bring this stuff up again? I mean, he shows up to a party and Jesus don't freak out because there's a few inebriated people around him. I mean, I'm telling you, if Jesus were physically in the flesh on the planet today, I'm convinced he would spend less and less time in churches. He'd probably be more at the bars and the clubs than anything else. And we would absolutely crucify him all over again. He'd probably go hang out with some folks that we would say is questionable. He'd probably go hang out with a group of homosexuals and just let them know I love you because they're the lepers of this society. He'd go hang out with some folks. And we would say, oh, that's questionable. His doctrine is questionable. He showed me he said, this is what the law is always saying, but this is what I say to you, freaking out the religious because only God can change the law. And they're like, what in the world is going on here? I mean, Jesus showed up and, and subverted.
perverted stuff. He, he left stuff up. I mean, I'm telling you, if he was alive today, he would be crucified again. He really would. Think about some of us grace folk. Don't say, okay, I need one more too far. And this is questionable. God, we have to check out our feelings about that whole thing because He is the Lord of you. Jesus came above everything else to show us that God is the Lord. In Him there's no shadow of turning, and in the name of rules and laws and religion, as I shared last night, we will fight with people, we will argue with people, we will put text in the end. But we end up being like Moses. Moses missed the promised land, not because he broke the law. Moses hung down from the mountain, he broke the law, and he wasn't judged. But when he struck the rock, the rock, Paul tells us, is Christ. And Christ is also in us, and we are called the body of Christ. In other words, rule breaking is one thing, but Beating brothers and sisters, beating the body in the name of our favorite rule will always lead to mess in our world. And there's a lot of times I think that I, in the name of the rules, I have beat the body, thinking that it's true. Just out of love, and they tear and die. And to end the wrath that is the tearing of your human condition. We live in a world where millions of children starve to death each year when we spend trillions of military funding. The human race spends more money and time on taking life than it does to save it. The gospel introduces the idea that peacemakers are blessed of God and that God judges righteousness by how we take care of the poor, the prisoner, the sick, and the least of them. The true meaning of life is in the gospel. It is about turning vengeance into forgiveness, eradicating fear with love, and turning greed into generosity. It is about recognizing that we are made in the image and likeness of God, and that He gives value to life, all life. The gospel gives us the hope that the world can be reborn through love, through its love on the cross of other the way. Jesus put it like this in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 24 and 25. That's the analogical passage. That many times our life is never good, but we can never use the last days of work. And that's a whole other discussion. Matthew 24, speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem and things that were coming, that were coming about 40 years later, but he gets to Matthew 25 and he starts sharing these parables. And he gets to a parable about sheep and goats. Now, first of all, let me say this. You know, there's all kinds of people that teach about sheep nations and goat nations and how that exactly works. It's kind of you know, crazy to me because I don't know a lot of the end time teachers teach that, you know, China is a goat nation, but China right now is one of Christian nations in the world, and they actually have a plan in place that by 2030 uh, that there will be Christians running most of the heads of company and most of the heads of state. They're planning on taking over China. Okay, they're not. They're not, they're not planning on being in the of that army that whenever the Euphrates dries up comes out and wipes up God's chosen people in Israel. All right, I mean they're, they're actually planning. All right, on, on seeing the world saved 
in their world transformed. And so we got all the teachings on all this, but to a Jew, when a Jew heard the goat or a sheep, they went in their mind to sacrifice it. They went to offerings. And to a Jew, when they heard goat, they went to the scapegoat that was that was crucified, that, that was that was killed outside the kingdom. And you know, Jesus was also a picture of that about where he was crucified. But they also went to the sheep or the lamb that would have went to an atonement offering. In other words, this is a picture of also showing those that have a scapegoating mentality compared to those that have a redeeming mindset. Okay, so if you have a sheep heart or a sheep mindset, it's going to be about redemption. It's going to be about atonement. It's going to be about uh, about reconciling people. If you have a goat mindset, then it's going to be you know those people. It's going to be that mindset of us and them. And Jesus goes on to say this, explains to that, and then he says something very interesting. He turns to his disciples and he said, There was a time where I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was thirsty. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was Jesus, when was you in prison? I, I, I missed that one. I've been with you all this time. Did something happen when I was asleep? What's going on? I mean, they're freaking out. They're like, Lord, we've been with you. When did this happen? And he said this, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to the least. This is what the Lord said to me a couple months ago when I was on Eastern Rock and some stuff. He said, until we can see humanity Until I can see every human as Jesus. Well, but they're not acting like Jesus. Yeah. Well, but, but, but you don't know what they've done to me. They're, they're my enemy. Well, that's why you love your enemy, because you love Jesus. Are, are, are you all still with me? Are, are we doing okay so far? Man, I'm telling you, this is what the rubber needs to roll right here, guys. You, you want to know that you're growing and maturing? Is that you can learn how to love that person that has absolutely got your last nerve. That, that if you really want to know what maturity looks like, it's not about how much scripture you can quote and, and, and how deep we all are. You know, I mean, if you really wanted to hear some deep stuff, you know, I mean, you should have bought some of my old series from about 10 years ago because I mean, I ain't stuff to make your head spin. I didn't have to know what you were But uh, I mean, but in this season of my life, I'm realizing the gospel is not difficult. It is getting simpler and simpler and simpler to me. Love one another as I have loved you. Because until I can see every human as Jesus, as Jesus, I can give you a couple of simple examples. Jesus dies and stuff like Before the cross, Jesus said something interesting. You'll see that. That's what I'll do. He said, The moment they ran to Peter, that the Lord asked for Peter, he took that one with the two. You know why? It's because he's like, he still sees me as Peter. He still sees me as chip off the old block. I'm not Simon. Because when Jesus would get frustrated with him, sometimes he called him Simon. But, but he didn't remind him of who he was before he met Jesus. He reminded him of his sonship. Even though he didn't confess Jesus, Jesus still confessed him. Because under the law, you do your part, then God will do his part. But after the law, God said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. I'm going to do my part. I'm faithful to myself. It's not me being faithful to you. I'm faithful to myself. Because how? How now I view you 
you sound like you me because we are as Jesus says. No wonder now, no wonder now when we behold the image in the mirror and the glory of God is changed into that image. When you look in the mirror, the image you're supposed to see is Jesus. That's why, that's not how you can learn how to really look at the vision of yourself because you realize that when you look in the mirror, you're also looking at Jesus. And I don't don't go get don't get crazy about it and tell me God either. Come on, you with me. In other words, he said, I want you to see yourself. Holy. Everything that's true of him is not true of me. I'm, I'm healed and whole and prosperous. Everything that he declared about him is now something true of me because I am as he is, because it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And if the Christ that lives in me, I now live in this world by the faith of the Son of God. And if I can learn how I love him, it's also how I'm showing the love for myself and then how I love humanity that Jesus rises from the dead. In other words, he likens directly Peter's love for God by how he loves people. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus appears to Saul on the Damascus road and Saul gets knocked down on the ground, Jesus appears and says this to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting those people? He said, why are you persecuting me? Because how you treat them is how you treat me. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's, I get why people want to stand the line. I'm under law, I don't really have to mess with you at all. I'm under law, I just keep the rules. And if I don't like you, I get to vote you. I still really have to love you if I don't want to love you. I mean, but, but, but under this law, uh, this new covenant, this royal law, this law of love, it's everything that you just have power to do with your hand. Now, how we love, see, Jesus came to remove the mineral of partition. There's no more us in the devil. And he was giving this picture that he's saying, the people that you would say are those people, those prisoners, those that are holding up the most sacred characters, those people that society throws away, the, those people that are, 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 are strangers, aliens, those people. He said, how you treat those people is how you treat me, because they are us. And until we can view humanity through Jesus' eyes, I'm going to assume this in the end of the church that I've ever seen. One of the leaders in the church is in her 60s. She's going to be in tears crying. And she said, You may not have to love my son in law right now. He was treated by God in a horrible way. And he's not being treated by great that is special. I said, I'm not saying you trust them. I mean, loving someone that, that has hurt you, that has really been just avoiding you, you know, we're just still loving someone. Mean, listen, there's people that you don't necessarily let in your circle because they've broken trust, but your love for them never changes. Matter of fact, that's how we really know we're getting somewhere in the gospel is when we can love when we view humanity, that's Jesus. Jesus said, if you've done it to them, you've now done it to me. If you do it to the least of these, you've now done it to me. Our, our first year, when we, when we started the church in Saginaw, one of the things that I prayed, uh, and I, I literally prayed this this way, I said, God, Worship, but when a drug addict, a 
on the east side of Wakeside, across the creek, or one of the yellow ladies stripping down at the beach after the women wake up on a Sunday afternoon because they didn't get home till about six in the morning, or the man living in a million dollar house up in the township that hurt his back and he'd rather take it to Sunday into harder drugs and he's lost his family and his business has fallen apart. No matter whether they're up and out and down and out, no matter what they're going through, that when they wake up on a Sunday, they say, I just need to go somewhere today where I won't be judged. And I can go somewhere and I'll just be loved by a human soul. And the thought they have is to come to the church. Let's be very honest. Normally when people, that their lives are a wreck in some form, normally the last place they think of going to is church. Because normally they're going to walk in feeling all messed up and someone's going to look down the nose at them or anything else. And I say, God, I want us to be known as a place, no matter what issues people have, that they can walk in there and they'll feel unconditionally loved. So we had this man, we, when we started, we, we were meeting in a basement hall with like orange red carpet and mirrors all around the bar in the corner. And I kind of miss that sometimes. We just have fun to go somewhere that's pleasant. I mean, if you want to get your if you're taller than 5'10 and you want to get your brains on, you have to sit in the middle section. The side sections, you put your hand up and everything, but that was just to look like a real low ceiling. Actually, they had to somewhat really spring themselves back to the ceiling. We, we, we have this man, and, and the man's been on my heart so much like we've not seen him now for about a year. I asked the police, I think that guy's changed by the end of the day, so they have not seen him. He said, I don't know if he went inside. I don't know what happened, but he's really been on my heart. His name's Jeff. And, and Jeff's been setting it off, and I've been known as one of the top drivers here in Jefferson. And Jeff rides his bike everywhere, and this little devil uh, told me to be able to grab a license plate of somebody. Always had elbow pads and knee pads on. You know, if you come to church, elbow pads and knee pads are a bad guy. And they always had elbow pads and knee pads because the kids walk and fall off the bike. And uh, he was going by the first place in the meeting that he heard the music come from. And he was parked into a circus ring. He walked in, and everybody just lined up and walked up in the back door. And he just went behind him and he said, church is really supposed to look like a corporate gathering is that a norm can show a norm is overweight, you know, he's not even happy about himself. I mean, he don't like his job, his dead end, he ain't happy with beer on his marriage, it's going nowhere. You know, I mean, he just wants to drink his life away, but he finds that he don't like his job, he don't like being home, but he shows up to the Cheers bar and he walks in and everybody says, Norm, he goes somewhere where everybody knows his name and he feels loved unconditionally where no one is judging him. Thank you. 
knew what religious people think about something. You know, they are these with the greasy grace stuff. You know, they don't believe in this thing. I don't even, you know, I mean, listen, I, I, I want people that want to come out of religion that are hungry to come be a part, and I'm going to love them unconditionally no matter what. But, but I, I'm really not concerned about those that want to fight. If they're already in the boat and, and, and they're already serving Jesus, man, listen, man, if you serve him differently than me, that's cool. You know, I'm going to love you no matter what. But there's a bunch of chefs out there. There's a bunch of people out there, and they've not experienced it. When they got around most Christians, they got around a bunch of mean people. Some of the meanest people I ever met go to church every Sunday. I mean, just mean. Y'all ever been around them? You know what I'm talking about. They come to you, fight you, talk about you, talk about you, scream. I mean, I've been to church meetings where I've been, oh, poor my God. I mean, mean. That's an example. I'm like, where's the love, man? We're supposed to be known for the one thing. Can I tell you, it's the one thing the body of Christ is known to be for. If we're going to change our city, we're going to have to love it. And we can't preach it anymore. You're going to miss us today. You know, listen, we keep praying. I think it's so funny. You're going to get prayed in here. with the praying in your seat, but just make sure that when you walk out of the building after you pray, that you pull out. Once you start releasing some of that love before you go, rather than sitting there just praying and screaming and finding every demon and devil and trying to bring God where you deserve it, you can do just about it anyway, but I want you to just remind them of the thing that you want to love them the other day on Sunday morning. But what, what, what you're all caught up in the stuff that I believe many times, uh, I'm just going to throw this out there. Somebody, as long as you don't target your neighbor, as long as you don't go serve them, as long as you don't go mow the lawn, as long as, as long as you don't say, "How can I love you? How can I serve you?" As, as long as, as long as you're ignorant at the mall, and you won't hold it over for someone where you're not funny or on your job, and nobody at work even knows you're a Christian because you're ordinary. Then hey, you don't mind coming to church as long as you guys just. still trying to just get convinced he loves us. Because if I'm not completely convinced and confident of his love, then man, I'm probably not going to love other people either because I don't even know who really likes me. But I'm not close to him. This is how we all will know that we love him. When we make one witness for each other. Oh! 
wonders. But the kingdom, rather than the kingdom, is what kingdom? Jesus was in front of sinners. Notice the scenes that come next that then not everybody was in this, not everybody changed. They got right with where they were just in the midst of sin. He was in front of the publicans, like this tax collector, he was in front of the prostitutes, like this tax prostitute. He wasn't just in front of any sinners, he was in front of sinners. Yes, he was not offended with the nation. He wasn't so holy that he changed God's name suffering in our presence. He did not have that. He was in his way. He didn't call for them to even try to get them to do something. I'm, I'm telling you, the, the, the more, the more that God begins to just transform me in this, uh, you know, you think I, I, I've been, you know, waking up singing to you, little to you, so I, I'm telling you, I think I'm singing all of you, you little girl. I mean, I, they had a revelation of something. It's what the world is looking to look for. Don't change. I'm, I'm going to keep praying for you, and I'm going to keep loving you. But it's hard to love some of those people. You tell Jesus, he came to his own, and they received him not. He was only in the house of his friends. And let me say this: the night he was there, the people that had been there that were part of this party are the ones that were closest to him. A lot of times, the ones we have a difficult time. Cross is what you're nailed to that brings you pain. And then he goes on to explain what it really looks like. And he said this, for a father to die that your mother you live in, brother and sister. And he wasn't saying test them. What he was saying is this, is that taking up your cross is going to cause you to not have to learn how to love the people that you're nailed to. It's easy to love someone I don't know. You know, it's easy. Hey, I don't know that you can do that. You can go on a mission trip. But you don't have to love them. I mean, it's easy to go on a mission trip. You just man, you just fall in love with them. You love them until then the missionaries move there. And then you got to live around them. And then, and then they're saying stuff about you. And they're being under and real love is demonstrated in the day. It's manifested in family. That, that, that when we're family and we rub each other the wrong way, we just choose to love. Period. That, that's one of the reasons why I mean, most of the time you can't learn to get people stay connected in community because, you know, you get offended so easy. And the truth is, there's no offense in love. I mean, most of the time, it's, it's not that we fell out of love with Jesus or we don't really love others. It's just, I really don't want to love you as Jesus. I don't, I don't want to see you that way. You hurt me, so I put up all the walls, but you always end up hurting me. The ones that are there. The ones that are there. Praise God. Are you what you're following? I thank you for it. Holy 
Spirit on us that you can come to us. Help us to see the reality of your love. Help us to see one another and those you see, Lord. Teach us how to love those that are hungry, those that are thirsty, and those that are in prison, and those that are strangers. Teach us how to love the least of these. How we treat them has so much to do with what we think about you and how we show you love in this new covenant is our love for humanity, not not screaming at humanity, not pointing out all of humanity's issues because that doesn't work. We've for too long tried to clean fish before we caught them. We've got to love them unconditionally. And once we learn how to love, then that life begins to be released out of it. Holy Spirit, teach us. It is the love of God that's set abroad in our heart by you. So, Holy Spirit, teach us. Teach us how to love our spouses more. Teach us how to love our families. Our kids. Teach us how to love our enemies, those, those that are rubbing us the wrong way, that are saying things about us that are lying about us, where there's been misunderstandings. Show us your love and show us how to love. 